what gear do you realize that a car is everything it's supposed to be? The summer of 2003 abounded with talk of Ford's supposed Ferrari killer, the 2004 GT40, a faster, quicker to break counterpart to the Ferrari 360 Modena. The Ford's high-performance race car certainly dressed to impress. But a Ford was still a Ford matched against Ferrari. At the same time, another killer of a premier brand lurked in the shadows, awaiting its chance to pounce on the competition. Sony's kill zone played Terminator in this scenario. Its prey, the game-changing Halo Combat Evolved from Bungie and Microsoft. Months of rumors about the so-called Halo killer generated enough hype to reach a fever pitch before Sony even formally unveiled its new first-person shooter. Premature reports describe the game as the perfect cross between Halo and SOCOM. Claims of advanced technology, spectacular graphics, and destructible environments heightened the anticipation tenfold. More importantly, PlayStation faithful were thrilled with the prospect of its purported online multiplayer capabilities. Killzone's official announcement amplified the anticipation, yet its eventual deployment fell short of the unrealistic expectations. This would ostensibly become the status quo for Killzone going forward. Marketing cycles that promised generation-defining experiences, but arguably amounted to shooters of the slightly above-average variety. In this way, Sony's flagship FPS series never competed with that of Microsoft's in a traditional sense. It carved out its own niche with six adventures launching across a nine-year period, but in the end, Killzone was still Killzone matched against Halo. And it hardly helped that the former battled false advertising claims on more than one occasion. This is the rise and fall of Killzone. Guerrilla Games hit the ground running as the Amsterdam-based Lost Boys games at the turn of the century. A handful of Game Boy titles were turned out first, however the crew had its heart set on showcasing their coding and art skills to the industry at large. 3D artist Arjen Bokhoven wrote in a developer diary that building a stylized tech demo marked the first step. The demo titled Marines depicted soldiers maneuvering through a battlefield. Explosions and sound effects texturing the scene that constituted the earliest version of Killzone. Upon its completion, the team shopped the build to various decision makers within the industry. One person demoing the project for Sony resulted in the Japanese tech giant gauging Lost Boys' interest in expanding the impressive showpiece into a fully-fledged PlayStation 2 game. According to Bokoven, the challenge was accepted without hesitation. By the end of 2001 then, work had begun on a new shooter for PlayStation hardware, specifically the first-person shooter the world had been waiting for. Such ambitious ends manifested as a sci-fi project that placed special emphasis on a premier story campaign and quality local and online multiplayer modes. But these high-level goals proved only as good as the technology used to bring them to fruition. Thus, instead of shopping for a licensed game engine, the developers at Lost Boys built proprietary tech equipped with features that promoted realistic ragdoll physics and directional damage. Though anonymous sources cited in early reports allege the kill zone creators relied on the commonly used NURBS model to render in-game surfaces, Lost Boys went with the multi-layered texturing system. This internally developed tech altered the number of textured layers shown on objects, instances contingent on the user's distance from the model to dynamically raise and lower the level of detail. A pursuit of realism carried over into AI development as well. Chiefly, the studio targeted advanced artificial intelligence that behaved believably during combat. So while scripted scenarios often dictated ally and enemy actions, all NPCs needed to appear reactionary when contending with unscripted happenings. Properly balancing the AI especially proved integral since users could choose from one of four playable characters, with the remaining three serving as computer-controlled teammates. Finely tuned balancing acts were similarly necessary for the creation of Killzone's fiction and the visual language that breathed life into it. Bokova noted that visual designers conceptualized each character, object, and location, then passed them along to the production department for almost blueprint-like designs that later informed the game art. 
Each effort combined to formulate an adventure centered on a near-future galaxy-spanning conflict that stemmed from science fiction. However, classical military engagements throughout human history influenced many facets of the experience, from the trench combat of World War I to the guerrilla warfare employed during the Vietnam War. Unfortunately for Sony and its partners in Amsterdam, the lead-up to sharing such information ran rampant with rumors that prematurely set the stage for Killzone's arrival. The Killzone universe played host to a mankind in the not-too-distant future that successfully colonized space. Humanity's special skill for waging war followed it beyond the stars, though, setting off an interplanetary war between the Earth-loyal collective, the ISA, and a militant splinter organization known as the Hellgast. The first installment opened with a band of ISA soldiers trapped behind enemy lines, navigating a kill zone, as it were, hence the franchise's namesake. Notably, before the Killzone designation became official, Lost Boys tentatively referred to the title as Kin. It was this name that generated an unprecedented level of anticipation within the PlayStation community during the summer of 2003. Around June of that year, official PlayStation magazine UK teased Kin, going so far as to deem it the best game the publication had ever laid eyes on. Nearly two months later, insider sources claimed Ken had evolved into Killzone and would constitute an advanced first-person shooter packed with online multiplayer options. A brand new engine powered the game, sources confirmed to IGN, telling the outlet the production team had pushed the limits of PS2 to deliver incredible visuals and destructible environments. The notion of this project serving as Sony's so-called Halo killer picked up steam around this time, too effectively making Killzone what IGN termed the most talked about pieces of shadowware in the industry. Sony originally showcased the game to European outlets in April 2002, keeping the specifics under wraps for over a year thanks to non-disclosure agreements. Upon publicly lifting the veil in August 2003, Sony and the then newly named Guerrilla Games had plenty to share, though some details were strategically withheld. Gameplay footage and multiplayer-related information wouldn't see the light of day for several more months. Yet, the ISA vs. Hellgas premise, along with screenshots, maintained the hype train's momentum. Guerrilla and his publishing partner kept up the pressure for months on end, releasing news piecemeal that continuously stoked interest in the new sci-fi IP. The single-player campaign promised dozens of levels spread across 11 environments, which users would feel encouraged to replay in three additional playthroughs since all four heroes possessed unique combat skills. Sony additionally heralded Killzone as a variation on traditional squad-based shooters, selling hopeful customers on the idea that the three AI companions followed their own objectives without the need for players to issue orders mid-fight. Multiplayer offered a different experience entirely, coming in the form of offline split-screen co-op and 16-player online. All things considered, Killzone seemed equipped to run in the same race as its competition on Xbox. Ultimately, many concluded it couldn't compete on Halo's level. Sony shipped Killzone on November 2, 2004, one week ahead of Halo 2's eagerly anticipated debut. More than anything, critics were astounded by Killzone's visuals, the little details here and there, layered textures capable of tricking the eye into perceiving finer touches that weren't necessarily present. Shooting mechanics went over players as well, as did the relatively novel premise of humanity staving off an invasion from its own dark variant. However, minuses hampered each of these pluses, shortcomings that kept Killzone from reaching its fullest potential. Technical issues riddled the experience, ranging from distracting frame rate drops to graphical hitches. Some reviewers remarked that the game's sophisticated texture system too often failed to appropriately swap in low-quality models for their high-quality counterparts, culminating in awkward-looking close-up scenes. The otherwise appealing gameplay mechanics buckled under the weight of its own deficiencies due to lacking enemy variety, ineffective AI companions, and weapons that hardly set Killzone apart from other first-person shooter fare. And though the core conceit behind the story campaign received applause across the board, the storytelling's execution faltered. Unfulfilled expectations aside, Sony had faith in the burgeoning property. The Japanese publisher believed so wholeheartedly in Killzone that it reportedly gave the green light for pre-production on a sequel a few months before the first installment launched, 
Sony evidently had no intention of letting the Dutch studio get away either. March 2004 saw the two companies ink an exclusive development deal. At the end of 2005, Guerrilla Games officially became a member of PlayStation's first-party family. Phil Harrison, president of SCE Worldwide Studios at the time, insisted the buyout would strengthen Sony's development portfolio on the eve of PS3's release and beyond. The hardware manufacturer's expansion into the world of first-person shooters had only just begun. We got multiple Hellgas vessels approaching. What do we do, sir? Fire! Lukewarm reception aside, Killzone shipped 2 million units worldwide, success earned despite its creator's various fumbles throughout production. Guerrilla's then-managing director, Herman Holst, gave a talk during GDC Europe 2010, walking panel attendees through the ways in which the studio approached game development. Holst fondly recalled the decision to prioritize creating a memorable villain over a favorite hero. Though he acknowledged the strife between the Hellgast and ISA boiled down to space Nazis versus space good guys. It proved a winning formula, though. The Hellgast's distinctive gas mask and orange-tinted goggles quickly becoming an iconic visual for the PlayStation brand. Killzone artists modeled the mask after concepts of World War I goggles positioned over a Russian World War II-era oxygen mask. Details shared in Cook and Becker's Killzone Visual Design Book noted the eyewear gained the colorful tint once playtesters criticized the difficulty of spotting enemy combatants. These clever artistic choices paved the way for the franchise's aesthetic identity. But such sparks of brilliance were all Killzone had going for it through the lengthy production cycle. Holst divulged in his GDC talk that Guerrilla knew its futuristic military shooter missed the mark a belief attributed to the team's unrestrained ambitions and insufficient leadership. For a significant period of time, the Killzone group went without a game designer on staff, resulting in programmers and artists building the game world. The absence of design expertise meant creative decisions were implemented that hardly took into account how the game would play. Worst still, a later juncture in development spawned an imprudent decision whose effects broke the game engine for months forcing artists to craft and install assets despite being unaware of their function in-game. A fix for Guerrilla's managerial woes fortunately blossomed just in time for the unlikeliest of projects. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the latest addition to the PlayStation family. Needing a showcase title for its first handheld, Sony proposed Guerrilla produce a Killzone offshoot for the PlayStation Portable. Herman Holst said the pitch was far too enticing to turn down, given Guerrilla's appetite for exploring new technology. Yet, before diving into the Herculean task, the firm had to reckon with Killzone's mismanagement. The studio appointed a game director to oversee the PSP project and maintain quality standards. Producers also joined the fold, ensuring various milestones remained on target for the game's planned ship date. A concentrated effort to focus on game design entered the picture from the outset as well. That the PSP title reviewed better than its forebear later indicated organizational changes were for the best. Not compressing Killzone's console experience to the handheld machine served as another wise choice made in the embryonic stages. When digging its heels into what would become Killzone Liberation, around early 2005, Guerrilla had to consider whether a first-person shooter would translate well on portable devices. Production manager Alistair Burns told GameSpot, no one believed it could work hence the implementation of a third-person camera. Crafting the experience around gaming on the go represented a top priority and pushed the decision to pull back the third-person perspective for an isometric viewpoint. Speaking with IGN ahead of E3 2006, game director Matthias Dion said the overhead angle provided a tactical overview that enabled extra graphical details and nice parallax effects. 
Dion later elaborated in a sit-down with Gaming Nexus, divulging how the creation of the Pseudo-Isometric Intelligent Camera System, or PIX, elevated Killzone's new perspective by dynamically zooming in and framing any given scenario in the best possible way. Guerrilla similarly applied its pick-up-and-play approach to the user interface and moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Players control the protagonist, Templar from the original, through the PSP's lone analog stick, then issued ally commands via D-pad inputs. A simple command menu facilitated these functions, hammering home the streamlined feel and further promoting tactical gameplay. All in all, touchstones of this nature merely scratch the surface of the lengths Guerrilla traveled to both refine and reimagine the key tenets of Killzone. The ISA dealt a devastating blow to Hellgast forces at the end of Killzone. However, the Hellgast's occupation across large swaths of the planet Vecta allowed the group to reorganize and launch a counterattack that hinged on the abduction of several important ISA members. Such acts, along with heinous misdeeds committed by the villainous new character General Armin Matrak, placed Templar back into play just two months after the first game's events. Liberation's direct continuation of the original story underscored how seriously Guerrilla viewed the project. It was a portable spin-off, sure, but one developers used to kickstart the franchise's evolution. Thus, the studio sought to improve its storytelling chops. Other generally well-received aspects of Killzone, like the visual style and weapons, received adjustments in their own right. The crew didn't shy away from tackling the previous game's lesser appreciated qualities either, addressing critiques leveled against sloppy death animations, poor AI, and repetitive speech. Given their intrinsic value to Killzone, multiplayer features were a must-have for the PSP version. As such, the handheld's ad hoc mode connected two users in co-op for single-player missions, while up to six players could fight in online game modes. The title even supported voice chat. Suffice it to say, Liberation performed a lot of heavy lifting during the brand's early days. Its surprise January 2006 announcement arriving amid lingering discussions about a Killzone 2 trailer whose questionable authenticity became the subject of deep scrutiny. Liberation sidestepped similar concerns, launching in late 2006 to favorable reviews that praised the relatively high quality graphics, ease of accessibility, and gameplay depth. Critics and players deemed it a solid shooter too, with many swearing by the belief that Liberation had delivered where the overhyped 2004 outing did not. Balancing issues on top of a flawed targeting system and platform-specific limitations prevented Liberation from hitting the highs Guerrilla coveted. Still, the PSP adventure critically outperformed Killzone's PS2 debut by a noticeable margin. The console game earned an aggregate score of 70% on Metacritic, while its portable follow-up climbed to 77%. During his 2010 GDC panel, Herman Hulst insisted the marginal improvement in scores demonstrated a gratifying upward trend. Killzone 2 would later soar to greater heights. But he's still a little bit lonely. I think he still needs more friends. So let's uh, stick in a couple more here. And this gives you an example of the overwhelming performance of PlayStation 3 and everything. Uh, that uh, you can do. Some of them are so uh, happy to leave the, uh, the, the bath, they, they jump out. But I don't think that's enough ducks. I don't think you can ever have enough ducks. And for the technically minded amongst you, this demo uses LOD, which is lots of ducks. <laughs> boom, boom. Ah, it did work. <laughs> right, now, you think that's impressive? In and around the PS3 era, Sony exuded a hubris that blemished the brand. That sense of pride felt earned in some ways, though. One in four American households owned a PS2, yet Sony had trouble supplying demand for the 2004 Slim model. PSP outperformed sales expectations early in its life cycle, generating $400 million in revenue after only seven weeks. Simply put, the root health of Sony's gaming division knew no bounds, emboldening the company to swing for the fences with the PS3's pricing in 2006. Executives Kaz Harai and Jack Tretton even asserted the next generation wouldn't begin until Sony's say-so, taking jabs at Microsoft's Xbox 360 launch. But corporate arrogance especially had its day during E3 2005, wherein the hardware manufacturer showcased a so-called real-time demo for a Killzone sequel that technically didn't exist. Killzone 2-related rumblings entered the public consciousness in August 2004, 
A few months shy of the original's market debut, having viewed the cover of a design document, IGN reported Guerrilla developers were unable to divulge anything concrete, but confirmed the sequel would not launch on PlayStation 3. Despite its eventual arrival on 7th Gen hardware, the studio initially intended to produce the game on PS2. Herman Hulst told GDC Europe 2010 attendees that Killzone 2's brief stint as a PS2 project had targeted a Christmas 2006 release window. However, work on this iteration was cut short. Executive producer Angie Smets elaborated further in Noclip's Horizon Zero Dawn documentary, in which she referenced a vision video Killzone developers designed for the sequel. Meant for internal use, the video depicted what Guerrilla imagined a then-next-gen shooter would look like in action. Overcast skies, intricate graphics, and intense combat encounters were the stars of the visionary piece, which Hulst claimed the studio hoped to unveil before select media members behind closed doors at E3 2005. Tangled up in its own ambitions and Sony's confidence, Guerrilla agreed to showcase the tech demo on stage. According to Smets, no one knew SCE chairman Kaz Harai would tell viewers the Killzone demo ran in real time on PS3. That anyone actually believed as much proved just as surprising. Two schools of thought followed in the demo's wake with respect to public perception. There were those who trusted the marketing speak, and others who refused to believe it counted as anything other than CGI-centric smoke and mirrors. Guerrilla considered the state of things a blessing and a burden. A blessing because the video's publicity provided a clear goal, and a burden because many felt the studio had squandered its reputation. Both Hulst and Smets recalled the tech demo heavily influencing the decision to shift to PS3 development, which in turn motivated the studio's increased headcount. The extra hands especially benefited production given the PS3's raw power. If Killzone showcased Guerrilla's art talents, Killzone 2 exhibited its game design prowess. They will know Helgan belongs to the Helgans. Developers established Helgan, the Helgast homeworld, as the setting of Killzone 2 early in production. The general idea focalized a massive planetary invasion on an alien planet dominated by the aggressors, leaving players outgunned and outnumbered. Selling this demanded the best in art and technology, thus rethinking the studio's approach to both seemed the best way forward. By this time, Guerrilla had become far better organized, splitting into subgroups that each answered to a singular leader, who regularly met with someone higher up the chain. This management style worked favorably, as it allowed the company to divide its focus across many disciplines simultaneously, a far cry from the bumbling Killzone 1 days. But Herman Hulst explained in a Making of documentary that the benchmark set by Killzone 2's tech demo still presented the biggest challenge. Targeting the demo's visual quality required a cinematic approach, rather than building something that looked pixel-precise. According to development director Aryan Bruce, the post-processing often used in film inspired Killzone 2's analog look, manifested in visual noise such as motion blur and over-brightening effects. Notably, the internally created Deferred Renderer engine ensured these details could be replicated in-game. Extra effort also went into fully realizing the impact of bullets hitting characters and materials. Blending animations achieved the desired effect in this regard, whereby the team melded real-time ragdoll physics atop regular character animations. If a player shot an enemy combatant in the shoulder, the struck body behaved accordingly. Likewise, impact effects were applied to the material system, and because various surfaces contained specific material types, Shooting a sand wall created a hole that bore no similarities to the impact created when firing shots at metal. These relatively minuscule details mattered most in the grand scheme, particularly when it came to designing Helgan. An alien world that appeared foreign to players was out of the question. The Helgast practiced fascism, a familiar political ideology the wider audience projected their own thoughts and feelings onto. Developers wanted the construction of Helgan's cities, factories, and architecture to reflect as much, so the pompousness of Stalinist architecture pervaded the Helgast home world. The works of Dutch filmmaker Paul Verhoeven, namely Robocop and Starship Troopers, provided a source of influence as well. 
Achieving realism, at least on a cinematic scale, also guided many of Killzone 2's technical decisions. Similarly, a push towards complete immersion explained the absence of a HUD. Cover mechanics were born from this same train of thought, providing tactical options lacking in the franchise's initial outing. No one would argue that these gameplay enhancements didn't amplify the single-player action, but the improvements felt particularly pivotal in the multiplayer modes. Guerrilla added online components to Killzone 1 at the tail end of production. The multiplayer suite's public reception suggested it needed more time in the oven, and the studio took that belief to heart when developing the sequel. Killzone 2's multiplayer matured alongside the story campaign. As a result, developers insisted on maintaining parity between the two modes in terms of graphical and performance quality. From a high level, Guerrilla knew it wanted Killzone 2's online suite to attract all player types, heralding a progression system spread across 12 military ranks. While ascending the ranks, players could unlock badges or classes that boasted unique abilities and weapons. The medic came equipped with skills disparate from that of the tactician, for instance, and as users progressed, the ability to combine class-specific skill sets strengthened their sense of ownership over the character. Better still, those who preferred solo play yet wanted to enjoy multiplayer could do so offline with AI bots and three difficulty modes. Guerrilla further crafted mix-and-match options in which players could add, say, 12 AI bots to a four-person game, resulting in a 16-player experience. Another noteworthy addition included a new spawn function for players to select respawn points after dying. A 64-person clan system buttressed the socially-driven features, with clan challenges and matches going on to provide some of Killzone 2's most exciting online encounters. In spite of its tumultuous introduction, then, few would have anything but fond memories of the Helgan set sequel. Following the controversial pre-rendered trailer, Guerrilla went silent on Killzone 2. The Liberation spin-off kept the IP afloat, but even PlayStation's staunchest supporters were growing weary with the sequel's long absence. Finally, it re-entered the limelight during E3 2007 with new footage that didn't look on par with the previous showcase, but came close enough to warrant praise. While news of a 2008 release window accompanied the reveal, Sony later delayed the shooter to February 2009 in hopes of thinning out its fall schedule crowded with SOCOM Confrontation, Little Big Planet, Motor Storm Pacific Rift, and Insomniac's own sci-fi shooter Resistance 2. The wait paid off tremendously, the series known for average review scores settling on a Metacritic score of 91 with its third entry, polished enemy AI, a strong campaign, balanced gameplay, great multiplayer offerings, the compliments wouldn't cease. Killzone had, at long last, lived up to its original promise, delivering a gritty first-person shooter unlike anything else. The game enjoyed a few commercial wins, too, garnering the biggest initial success at retail of any first-party PS3 title at the time with 1 million units sold in two months, despite early sales figures painting a grim picture. All told, Killzone 2 cemented Guerrilla among the brightest jewels in Sony's crown. The crew became more efficient with each subsequent release and managed to churn out games at a faster pace. Killzone 2's three-and-a-half-year production period thus turned into a roughly two-year cycle for the third mainline installment. Herman Hulst likened the quick turnaround to putting Guerrilla's creativity in a pressure cooker, but the technology and systems developed for the 2011 title made developing PS3 content much simpler the second time around. Nevertheless, the series necessitated improvements the studio knew it had to tackle upon entering production on Killzone 3. Reviewers and players had few complaints about Killzone 2, yet its somewhat homogenous environments left many longing for level variety. Guerrilla prioritized the creation of diverse locations and gameplay options as a result. Nuclear wastelands, alien-looking jungles, and an arctic setting counted among the newer playable areas on Helgan. Outer space served as an in-game locale to boot, significantly broadening the franchise's horizons. The broadening of Killzone also translated to its general scope, courtesy of levels whose footprint spanned ten times the size of the average Killzone 2 environment. Gameplay systems were likewise expanded upon. The best facets of the sequel, such as Lean and Peak, dialed up to 11, then layered with fresh elements like jetpack mechanics and minigun segments. 
Given the sheer breadth of the project, the claim that Killzone 3 utilized nearly 100% of the PS3's SPU load compared to Killzone 2's 60% hardly came as a surprise. What did strike some as shocking was the revelation that their shooter would support Sony's off-the-beaten-path endeavors. 2010 constituted the breakout year for 3D televisions. James Cameron's Avatar had just captivated audiences in theaters, creating unparalleled mainstream excitement around 3D technology. And with LG, Panasonic, and Samsung having spent years betting big on the future of 3D, consumers who could afford a specialized TV set were eager to bring the technology home for an immersive viewing experience. Of course, Sony sat among the manufacturers who invested in 3D. Dozens of first- and third-party games launched with 3D support on PS3. The likes of Batman, Arkham City, and Gran Turismo 5 included. Few received as much of a 3D-centric marketing push as Killzone 3, however. In discussing the topic with IGN, Managing Director Herman Hulst said 3D entered the picture in January 2009, just as the team was shifting away from Killzone 2. He reasoned that for a series dedicated to player immersion, 3D functionality marked the next natural step. The technology's immersive qualities lent themselves well to a player's ability to read the environment, Gorilla claimed. Killzone 3 also supported PlayStation Move, news that garnered a tepid response. Gorilla tried bolstering interest regardless. Principal programmer Tommy DeRoz even pontificated on the prospect of developers eventually integrating motion controls into most first-person shooters, contending that forfeiting accuracy was a trade-off for being able to point anywhere on the screen. The title may have presented a good case for motion controls, yet its successes in other disciplines catapulted Killzone to new heights. Naughty Dog's release of Uncharted 2 in 2009 elevated storytelling in video games. Many of the studio's peers took note, Guerrilla Games among them. Speaking to VG247, Herman Hulst recalled how shipping a game with great gameplay and an unrefined story was once fine. But Naughty Dog set a new bar, thereby inspiring Killzone 3 developers to invest more heavily in story, character building, and dialogue. Uncharted's lightheartedness equally informed the direction of Killzone 3 in that developers opted to minimize some of the grim overtones prevalent throughout Killzone 2. Senior producer Stavon Trahida acknowledged wartime as the unlikeliest of lighthearted affairs, but protested against the notion that dark and grim undercurrents provided the only worthwhile approach. Storytelling and tonal shifts aside, the property's bedrock principles remain the center of gravity, evidenced in Guerrilla's unrelenting raising of the stakes with respect to the Hellgast threat. The sophomore entry ended on a bittersweet note, as the ISA's Alpha Squad terminated the reign of Scholar Vasari, founder of the Helgen Empire. A power vacuum formed after his death, inspiring influential figures within the government to vie for control. Weapons manufacturer Johann Stahl played the biggest hand, rounding up ISA members for execution and equipping a private army with advanced weaponry that once more placed the franchise's heroes at an incredible disadvantage. This narrative beat incited the introduction of new weapons and enemy types who followed distinctive behavioral patterns. Raising the bar within the Killzone universe didn't only apply to the campaign. Multiplayer features underwent an overhaul of their own. But instead of drawing inspiration from elsewhere, Killzone 3's online crew looked inward to build upon what worked in Killzone 2. For instance, the beloved clan system's return was made all the more satisfying with the introduction of unranked practice matches. Level events featured in Killzone 2's DLC rejoined the fray as well, serving as user-triggered game changers that drastically altered the map. From the outside looking in, Guerrilla had amplified the technical marvel that was Killzone 2, then waded into uncharted waters to establish a new status quo for shooters on PS3. But whatever allure Killzone 3 wielded lasted only a short while. Nine months separated Killzone 3's May 2010 reveal from its February 2011 release. Awe-inspiring visuals, bombastic gameplay, and fun multiplayer action propelled the shooter to the top of PS3's list of must-play games. Though many deemed Killzone 2 the superior title, the third entry still managed to pull its weight in a market oversaturated with first-person military experiences. 
It faded to the background soon after launch, however, with third-party shooters Homefront and Crisis 2 stealing much of the attention that spring. Sales similarly tapered off early on, reflected in Killzone 3's inability to achieve launch sales in the same ballpark as its predecessor. Nevertheless, the interstellar war between the Hellgast and ISA waged on, playing host for marquee adventures on the next two iterations of PlayStation hardware. SCE Cambridge Studio, best known for Medieval, merged with Guerrilla at the start of 2012. After adopting the Guerrilla Cambridge moniker, the outfit entered production on a Killzone project, utilizing its handheld bona fides to reimagine the Hellgast and ISA conflict for Sony's next-gen portable, the PlayStation Vita. A mission to make the best portable first-person shooter ever drove the incipient stages of development. The team figured translating as much of the console experience as possible to the handheld would be the ideal way to accomplish this ambitious feat. Killzone on Vita, subtitled Mercenary, thus ran on a modified version of Killzone 3's engine, complete with mostly proprietary technology like the custom-built node-based editor used for the filmic post-processing effects. Art director Tom Jones shared in a Pocket Gamer interview that Cambridge also repurposed and scaled down assets from Mercenary's PS3 predecessor to better mimic the gritty, immersive, high-fidelity world players had come to expect from the series. Since Sony continuously positioned Killzone as its go-to showpiece for new hardware, the Vita exclusive outing needed to measure up. This line of thought likewise applied to Mercenary's storytelling, though the Cambridge crew approached the interplanetary war from a perspective far removed from that of the ISA or Hellgast. As opposed to defending the cause of one group, players assumed the role of a mercenary, assigned contracts on both warring sides. The concept spawned from an interest in exploring the narrative relationship between the two factions, specifically that which demonstrated nuances running deeper than good guys versus bad guys. In the boots of an unbiased gun for hire, Killzone fans witnessed how each group willingly partook in horrendous actions for the sake of their respective causes. The mercenary motif introduced new gameplay systems and mechanics, too, including the Vanguard, a wrist-mounted digital assistant that enabled the deployment of a drone and ion cannon via taps on Vita's touchscreen. Notably, the game's unified progression system across single-player and multiplayer perfectly complemented the mercenary concept. Considering the cash-based rewards and the action-reward-spend new action gameplay loop. And that finely tuned loop provided a solid template for the on-the-go adventure, such that Mercenary's nine campaign missions were designed for longer sessions, while Cambridge-style challenge missions in the vein of bite-sized objectives users could jump into when traveling. The retooling of Killzone's multiplayer for Vita required its own iterative process. Ultimately, the team concluded 4v4 competitive multiplayer offered the best way to play for technical and practical reasons. Lead designer Gareth Hughes told Pocket Gamer that on the technical side of things, Cambridge refused to compromise visual fidelity for a higher player count. On a practical level, supporting eight-person matches helped quickly fill lobbies. Developers maintain that concessions along these lines weren't the fault of the handheld's technical limitations. On the contrary, Hughes claimed Vita's capabilities imposed no restrictions in terms of content ideas. However, plans for an asynchronous challenge mode and multiplayer bots did land on the cutting room floor due to time constraints. Nonetheless, the experience that arrived in September 2013 appealed to FPS players far and wide. It even absorbed the attention of non-Killzone fans who'd been left disappointed after the Vita's first year of availability delivered subpar first-person shooters from Call of Duty and Resistance. The money system and on-point mechanics kept users engaged long after launch. Yet stilted gameplay, caused by frame rate drops and Vita's cramped controls, prevented Mercenary from competing with its console counterparts. The campaign, which ran parallel to events in Killzone 1 and 2, didn't stick the landing either. But players agreed the experience as a whole secured Mercenary's place as the best FPS title on Vita. Several weeks after the portable title hit stores, Guerrilla attempted to set the same precedent with a brand new Killzone adventure for PS4. Make him comfortable. Guerrilla knew Killzone's fourth console installment wouldn't launch on PS3, and thus made a point to reinvigorate the series for new generation hardware. 
Lead designer Eric Bolch has noted in a PlayStation Lifestyle interview that PS4's incredible processing power opened up new possibilities, therefore inspiring the near-future storyline set three decades after Killzone 3. Significantly moving the narrative forward called for a new hero and theme, all of which combined to enforce the idea that Killzone 4, as a title, felt out of place. Consequently, Killzone Shadowfall became the only mainline entry with a subtitle attached. Shadowfall fostered a status quo change on a deeper level, radically upsetting the balance of power between the Hellgast and Vectans, insofar as the Hellgast had evolved and designated themselves a genetically superior race. That the two rival factions cohabited the same metropolis exacerbated the generation's long tension, spilling over into a cold war that bordered on hot by the start of Shadowfall. Further still, the game invoked Cold War-era Berlin, with a vast wall dividing the city, which heightened the conflict to a degree, requiring interference from Special Forces operative Sergeant Lucas Kellen. Casting players as Kellen to restore balance encouraged more gameplay depth, but the PS4's potential, married with Guerrilla's proprietary technology, was what made newer advancements in the series possible. The studio leveraged every ounce of power it could from the console, culminating in higher-res textures and larger play spaces. Visuals no longer suffered at the hands of compromise either, choosing between prioritizing high dynamic range lighting or well-executed particle effects had ceased hanging over the head of developers who could now implement both. Plus, new ways to streamline production after the mix thanks to the ease of working on PS4. Procedurally generated assets altered how animations were handled, for example. As opposed to programmers generating high-level code, a lower-level system took charge and subsequently provided designers with more raw game data. This procedurally driven workflow notably introduced a greater number of character looks and behaviors. Senior technical artist Daniel Antonolfi equated the process to starting with a basic skeleton, then adding the procedural skeleton on top to flesh out believable characteristics. But in spite of PS4's boosted CPU, the console had limits. Sony later sat on the defensive end of another deceptive marketing fiasco following confusion about what those limitations entailed for Shadowfall's online modes. Curious to think we were once the same race. can finally take her home back. The technological leap between PS3 and PS4 was considered a case of diminishing returns, especially when compared to the astronomical jump between PS2 and PS3. Regardless, interest in screen resolution dominated the discourse ahead of PS4 and Xbox One's 2013 arrival. Xbox One didn't fare too well amid the contention, a result of certain titles running at 720p, while PS4 supported the same games at 1080p. But even as a first-party project, Killzone Shadowfall's technical prowess came with a caveat. Guerrilla unveiled the shooter during the PS4 reveal event. Between Shadowfall's February 2013 announcement and subsequent November release, Sony and company proudly touted its graphical fidelity and performance. The newer Killzone prioritized a strong visual presentation, however, whereas Call of Duty Ghosts prided itself on supporting 60 frames per second gameplay, Shadowfall only reached the milestone in multiplayer on most occasions with the campaign locked at 30 frames per second. Eric Bolchus explained that Guerrilla had no intention of sacrificing resolution and certain visual effects to favor performance. He surmised that, because of this, Killzone looked better than the competition. The frame rate news ruffled feathers, yet the multiplayer's inability to generate native 1080p struck the biggest blow. Neither its status as a PS4 launch title nor the middling review scores would be what many remembered Shadowfall 4 in the long run. Rather, its perception became marred by a deceptive marketing lawsuit filed within a year of release. U.S. resident Douglas Lador filed the suit in Northern District California court, claiming Sony misled consumers upon advertising native 1080p resolution for Shadowfall. Case documents referenced a technical shortcut Guerrilla used to convey a high-def effect in multiplayer, a process the studio detailed months prior. Apparently, multiplayer taxed the PS4's processor so heavily 
that employing a temporal reprojection technique was necessary to mimic the appearance of true HD. The door took umbrage with Sony advertising full HD for Shadowfall on its website and retail packaging, and argued that players complained of Killzone's multiplayer graphics being blurry to the point of distraction. Edelson PC, the firm that oversaw the Aliens Colonial Marines lawsuit, represented the plaintiff, who reportedly sought $5 million in damages. A U.S. district judge dismissed the suit with prejudice in May 2015, after Lador filed joint stipulation eliminating the need for the case to be heard in court. Shadowfall ultimately moved on from the PR nightmare, free DLC holding the audience's interest amid legal proceedings. The future of the brand remains uncertain, though. Weeks before shipping the PS4 title, Eric Bolchus confirmed the outfit would pursue a new IP that fueled a desire to branch out and create something completely different. Unbeknownst to fans, the Killzone maker had exchanged futuristic space wars for a future dystopia in which humankind lived primitively. Horizon's critical and commercial success effectively saw the face of Gorilla go from a gas mask with glowing red goggles to a young woman with flowing red hair overnight. And that much will likely remain the case for quite some time, considering Sony's expansion of the Horizon property with VR, multiplayer, single-player, and television endeavors. It would seem Guerrilla found its bread and butter in the third-person action space, an area of single-player storytelling that PlayStation all but cornered the market on during the PS4 era. However, quality first-person shooters have gone missing from PlayStation's original offerings, leaving a gaping hole that only the likes of Killzone could readily fill. But the sour note that rang out with Shadowfall begs the question of how soon will be too soon for PlayStation users to once again face off against the Hellgast threat. This video has been brought to you by you, the generous fans and patrons making all of this possible. From having your name appear in the credits, or even narrated by me, to gaining early, ad-free access to our entire library of content. Those who support us on Patreon will not only become part of the awesome community that enables us to make these videos, but receive a host of exciting rewards as a token of our gratitude. If you are interested in contributing to our work and helping our channel grow, head over to our Patreon page to discover all of the exclusive content and reward tiers we have on offer. Thank you for your support. Thank you for watching. We'd like to take this time to thank, by name, the generous patrons who have pledged to our Hall of Fame reward tier, Alex Moretti, and those currently subscribed to our producer reward tier, Brock Piviroto, Darirap Sigurdsson, GetWrecked.com, Jonathan, Kira May, Landy K. Hayes, Mario Herrera, Milkshake. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and backing us on Patreon.